Hello everybody. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. So much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I hope you're doing well. I'm doing fabulous. Thank you very much. And all the better for being with you in your company right now to share with you a wonderful story. So I hope you're going to get that quintessential perfect drink, whatever it is. And if it's something rather unusual, or if you enjoy a Pacific cocktail, let me know all about it. So before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, Everyone, welcome to the Hog and Hound Bar, said Rudy Rakinski, the bar manager. A round-faced man with a blushing face that was so pink it looked like he'd recently got burnt in the sun, which was definitely not the case for indeed his face was always pink. Behind the scenes, when people talked about him, they would refer to him rather unkindly as Pink Face, which was unfortunate, but the name seemed to stick, as everyone knew exactly who you were talking about. By all accounts, he was a jovial, rather jolly man, with a huge, vibrant sense of humour that equally matched his large, extended belly that had been acquired from knocking back way too many beers over the years. He had congenial, deep-set, bull terrier, chocolate-brown eyes that twinkled with merriment, and a very amenable disposition, so he was well-liked by all the locals. He spoke in a deep voice that definitely commanded respect. "'Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention?' The raised voices in the bar became hushed as he began to speak. "'I'm delighted to introduce you to Miles Fackerman.' who is an acclaimed, venerated, highly praised stand-up comic. We go back a long, long time together, when we were in our twenties, so we have a colourful history behind us. But the less said about that, I think the better. At the time, I tried my hand at being a stand-up comic for a while. But I hasten to say, I wasn't very good. I guess I got the most awful stage fright. My nerves got the better of me. Plus, my jokes were rather lame. Insipid and wishy-washy, I think. So I almost certainly got booed off the stage. People were brutally unkind back then. They wouldn't put up with squirming, insecure comics that floundered, blundered or writhed on their words like I invariably did. People lost patience then. So I was spurned and spat out, if you like, because I didn't pass the grade. I didn't have the audacious iron stomach for all those knockbacks and rejection. But the plucky, indomitable Miles Fackerman here most certainly did. He was made of far braver, tenacious and resolute stuff than I was. From day one all those years ago, he stood up fearlessly in front of the audience. Everyone loved him. So if anyone can give you a skip to your step tonight, it's no other than the great Miles Fackerman. So I have great pleasure tonight to introduce you to one of Seattle's most loved stand-up comics. He knows how to make you laugh like you've never laughed before. Thank you everyone for coming here to the Hog and Hound Bar tonight. If you haven't been here before, you are more than welcome. Our illustrious chef, Marco Fontaine, has a James Beard Award behind him. So don't hesitate to dine out on our exclusive menu. You will not be disappointed. There's also a 25% discount on all our colourful cocktails. Tonight, all the money we are raising is going to the Seattle Animal Shelter. So we will be exceedingly grateful for any extra donations you make to our little furry friends, of which most people here tonight are very eager to support. Everyone cheered as Miles Fackerman nodded his head. Yay! 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 The Hog and Hound Bar in Seattle was always busy, but no more so than on this suspicious night as animal lovers all over the county were bustling enthusiastically to order their drinks, while some people sat at tables surrounded by grandiose, rather sumptuous, red velvety, gold-striped upholstered chairs 
They were eagerly ordering the delectable mouth-watering food from the excellent extensive first-class menu, from which to date there had rarely been any complaints. The special of the day was grilled octopus over squid ink pasta with garlic and tomato sauce, or brown butter risotto with lobster. The sanguine, buoyant mood of the bar was animated, as male and female garrulous chatter was hoisted over the background noises, rather like a huge white sail blowing in a headwind, which is a very lovely feeling indeed. You could hear the clink of glasses, the tinkle of ice swirling around in colourful cocktail martini glasses with their little umbrellas and cocktail sticks strewn with exotic fruits, along with the clicking sound of the jukebox being injected with coins to produce more upbeat music that energised and electrified the already animated, fortified mood in the bar. Some rather inebriated, high-spirited people were gyrating their hips in time to the music, waving their glasses flamboyantly in the air, singing with ecstasy, as all inhibitions had been unleashed, rather like a horse being freed to run wild over the pastures without being shackled to its bitten reins. The bar manager, Rudy, was telling everyone to be quiet, as Miles Fackerman began his stand-up comic show. It was difficult to hush an intoxicated, tempestuous crowd. As with 20% of the drinks that night, people had gone wild with their orders. Unless you were teetotal, you were pretty much caught under the infectious allure of those ravishing drinks that created a somewhat raucous frenzy, that rather like a feral wildfire could not be easily tamed or subdued, as most people in the bar were staggering around precariously, as if the scaffolding of their own legs was failing to support their bodies in an upright vertical position. Miss Elisa Lamonte was sitting in the corner oakwood table, with about twenty of the locals that lived within fifteen minutes of her farmhouse in a rural, rather remote area outside of Seattle. She had actively encouraged them to come along to the bar in her large minivan. She was exceedingly passionate about supporting the animal shelter. She called herself a canopophile, which means very much a dog lover. At one time in her life she'd started a rescue centre for greyhounds. She was an attractive-looking woman in her early sixties, with a very good flawless complexion, a wild thicket of white hair that she tied up in a knot on her head, but most of her hair seemed to have a mind all of its own, was hanging loosely around her face in messy rat's tails that could not be tamed, which was contrary and incongruous with her very ordered Puritan personality. She commonly boasted that the last time she'd actually visited a hairdresser was when she was in her early twenties. It almost certainly showed. She wore a tangle of bright colourful scarves around her neck. Her rather voluptuous Rubenesque body was tightly contained in a black sequence dress that glittered with thousands of sparkling rhinestone jewels, about five sizes too small for her, seemingly holding her jiggly bits together like a tight corset, which made many people secretly wonder if the poor woman could actually breathe. Everyone seemed to be having a marvellously good time, but most people were completely plastered, with the glorious cocktails being so cheap. It was very easy to get caught up in the moment, go extravagantly overboard, indulging beyond the threshold of what may be considered reasonable and safe alcohol levels. Bobby Finnegan and Carter Botting got caught up in a bladder drunken brawl. Two of the guests that Alicia had invited to the comedy show. Now they had become the show. Soon the stand-up comic was overshadowed by the two inebriated men that were throwing their fists at each other while everyone was cheering on, almost as if they thought the drunken brawl was all part of the comedy act, which they found hilarious and cleverly done, failing to realise that it actually was a genuine fight. "'I'll bloody kill you!' said Bobby. "'He said my wife was a fat, stupid cow!' he told the audience. Did you hear that? He called my wife a fat, stupid cow. No one, no one calls my wife a fat, stupid cow. No one, do you hear that? In defiant retaliation, Bobby chided, Your wife, your wife looks like a man. Your wife looks exactly like a man. She's got hair on her chin. She's growing her beard. <laughs> The crowd cheered, teasing Carter Botting. One man piped, Your wife is growing a beard. That's got to be way worse than being a fat cow.
At that, Carter became incensed. He began oscillating his arms around like an angry, indignant octopus, but he kept striking the air as his coordination was way off the mark. His futile attempts to fight back got the crowd clapping and cheering in delight. Carter's face grew crimson with rage. His rounded hazel eyes looked furious. His jaw was clenched very tightly. My wife, I'll have you know, my wife is not growing a beard. Then it was his turn to pipe something nasty again. Your wife, your wife, she stinks. She smells of chip fat. She smells of ship fat and grease. She smells greasy. Well, that's because my wife can cook. Yours can't make anything without burning it into a cinder. My missus says your wife is the worst cook in the world. The worst cook. I stuffed the sausages in my pocket that she made. They were as hard as rocks. Inedible! Inedible! You hear that? Hear that, cried one man. Your wife's cooking stinks. No one wants a wife who can't cook. At that, everyone in the bar cheered, and Carter finally managed to push Bobby on the floor. They were fighting each other like two rabid dogs, with fists hitting the floor with very cloddish manoeuvres. They were clumsy but comical to watch. The applause escalated as people took sides, some shouting for Carter, others for Bobby. Right, I've had enough, said Alicia, going up to the two men, kicking them with her bright, shiny, black high-heeled court shoes. Get up, the two of you! Stop this fighting at once! I've had enough of it! Everyone in the bar shouted, Stop the fighting! Stop the fighting! Stop the fighting! But it was more like a chant. Alicia pulled the two men onto their feet, slapping their faces indignantly. I brought you here tonight to have a great time, to support an animal charity. But look how you've let me down. You've brought shame on our whole group. Instead of looking like upstanding American citizens, we look like a bunch of loutish thugs or hooligans. Honestly, when are the two of you ever going to grow up? Indeed, Alicia was so enraged, hot under the collar, she informed the rest of the group that they were going at once. They were leaving now, ASAP. Most of her group were three sheets to the wind, tiddly, gin-soaked, completely trolleyed. They were giggling at everything, finding the most minuscule, absurd, rather mundane, commonplace things terribly amusing, like the scarves that Alicia was wearing, that one of the drunk ladies described as upmarket dish rags, which everybody found terribly funny, with the exception, of course, of Alicia, who was far from amused. The group was promptly escorted by Alicia out of the bar, while everyone cheered, as if they were praising a comedy show. That was the best comedy performance ever, came one man's voice. It was bloody, bloody brilliant. Even if I say so myself, you rarely had us fooled. Everyone clapped, nodding their heads in agreement. Best comedy act ever, they all agreed. Alicia was thinking privately to herself that the humiliating performance between the two best friends had been anything but a comedy show. But if that is what the audience of the Hog and Hound customers thought it was, all well and good. In truth, when Bobby and Carter got into a drunken altercation, it could be terribly funny to watch, although when things went too far, they often got out of hand. On one occasion, Bobby had ended up in accident and emergency with a broken nose, a dislocated jaw, four missing teeth. Surprise, surprise, what had the fight been over? Their wives, of course. I mean, what else would it possibly be? Having a dig at each other's wives was too close for comfort. It was always personal, a bone of contention for both men. It would rile them up considerably, causing them to lash out at each other. It was as if a snipe at their wives was a personal attack on them. They immediately would leap to their wives' defence. Normally the two men were the very best of friends, but throw a few drinks their way invariably the knives would come out the forked snake-like tongue spitting out derogatory words the deadly venomous rattles of some misplaced punches that left both men on many occasions ever so slightly beaten up with of course the occasional trip to accident and emergency 
But did these two men ever learn from their catastrophic mistakes or incredulous blunders when faced with their sobriety? Absolutely not. Of course they would go through the motions of apologising profusely afterwards to each other, confessing that every nasty word that came out of their mouths was just the drink speaking, nothing else. But in secret, in the cold, hard, cruel light of day, the two men would secretly ponder if many words spoken in jest had a ring of truth to them. Carter would wonder if Bobby had really stuffed his wife's sausages in his pocket. And Bobby would wonder if his wife did smell of chip fat. It's such a bummer, said Mrs. Landon, giggling uncontrollably, as she sat at a seat next to her husband in the minivan, wrapping the safety belt around her petite form. The normally dignified aloof woman had allowed her inhibitions to wither away this evening, as she, like many of the others in the group, had drunk far too much. I, I was really enjoying myself this evening, she told her husband, until Carter and Bobby got into a drunken brawl together. They completely spoiled the evening for the rest of us. But everyone at the bar thought it was part of the comedy act. They just lapped it up. They loved it. But I, I knew it was a joke. Well, we did have an exceedingly good dinner, didn't we? Her husband reminded his wife, taking her hand encouragingly in his, giving it a tight affectionate squeeze. Let's not kid. That octopus with the black noodles was delicious. I can't say I'm remotely surprised that the chef has got a James Beard award. Is everyone here? asked Alicia, whom in her younger days had been a school headmistress for an upmarket girls' school in Seattle. But she involuntarily acted as if she was still one, as once you're used to ordering people around, it can become ingrained in your psyche and Alicia loved nothing better than putting people firmly in their place, lecturing them about how things should be done. At the junior high school where she'd been headmistress, she had a formidable reputation, known as the Woman of Iron. "'Is everyone here?' she said, calling out the name she'd written on her list. "'Just say present if you are.' No one seemed to mind Alicia's bossiness, as going out for a drink on the town without worrying about driving was a huge bonus for the sixty-year-olds whom had been invited to the bar this evening in order to support the animal charity. The best thing of all about Alicia was she never drank a single thing. For her, losing control was like a deadly sin. But to her friends, Alicia's sobriety was a huge advantage when it came to receiving a safe lift home. Right, Bobby, said Alicia, you're sitting here in the front with me. I don't want you and Carter getting into another altercation together. I've had about as much as I can take of the two of you. Right, is everybody ready, she said. Please put your safety belts on. We're going now. Alicia put on some trendy, upbeat music. The minivan started up. She pressed down the accelerator pedal, sailing through the bright, twinkling lights of Seattle. By all accounts, it was a quiet Friday night, late in the evening. There weren't many cars on the road, although there were a few slosh-looking people on the streets, staggering back to their downtown apartments. Everyone in the minivan began to sing to the music happily. Alicia groaned to herself, swearing that next time there was a charity occasion at the bar, she would not be inviting Bobby and Carter along for the ride. Those two, whenever they were stoned, got completely out of control. She found herself thinking of the two men, rather like former pupils at her school in her heyday, when she was a headmistress. She had been a great draconian disciplinarian in those days. How she wished she could place those two men under detention. Pity they were way too old for that, she thought. Alicia privately thought to herself that she would invariably take some of the back rural roads. She knew a quicker way back to her rustic farmhouse. She had never attempted this journey before at night, and was oblivious to how challenging it would actually be. She hadn't bargained for the fact that everything would look so unfamiliar and alien to her when there were no street lights on. For what seemed easy to navigate during the light of day was like a befuddling obstacle course at night. Indeed, with only the lights of her minivan, as well as a somewhat obscure full moon, complemented by a tenebrous night that was almost impossible to see where she was actually going. Of course, being on rough roads not lined with asphalt meant that her van jolted and jiggled all the way. Her well-worn rubber tyres spraying up large volumes of dust and tiny pebbles that kept tinkling against the aluminium carcass of her van. For Alicia, the landscape all looked exactly the same. She began to privately worry that she might be getting hopelessly lost, 
but that was not something she was willing to divulge with any of her friends in the minivan, who were blindly oblivious and too half-cut to really even care, which in itself was a monumental blessing. In their sobriety, her friends would have lost patience with her tonight. Alicia was an exceedingly proud woman, who fancied herself as always being in control. The kind of person you would take with you to a remote desert island, as she would hold it together so tightly, remain as cool as a cucumber in precarious situations, slow to lose her nerves or get flustered, and tonight was no different. Everywhere she looked there were dense silhouettes of tall statuesque trees, namely ponderosa pines and Douglas firs, clustered together in congenial groups under a dark inky sky, although at night the trees did not look congenial at all as the slight wind that was blowing through the needled boughs caused them to sway in such a way it was almost as if the trees themselves were shaking their heads at her in a gesture of extreme displeasure, whispering to her that she wasn't welcome in these parts. Alicia shivered in trepidation, wishing she hadn't taken a shortcut home, but had chosen to take a straightforward road back to her home, where everyone would be staying overnight in her large farmhouse that boasted over eight bedrooms. Her guests' trucks were parked in the parking bay at her farmhouse. In the morning they would drive back to their homes once the alcohol had gone through their system. She had in mind to prepare a fabulous breakfast for all her guests in the morning. Bacon, eggs, sausages, mushrooms, tomatoes and toast served with fresh orange juice and tea. She could hear her guests singing in the back of her van in an intoxicated state while some had fallen fast asleep and were out for the count. She was beginning to realise she was driving around in circles, retracing her steps over and over again, taking all the wrong turnings in the road. Those were the days when the privilege of GPS and cell phones were a long way in the future, as this was 1985. Suddenly Alicia realised her van had run out of petrol. She had overlooked filling up the tank, falsely assuming she had enough petrol to get everyone back safely to her property but driving around in circles for over an extra hour or two had almost certainly drained her tank. The van came to a sudden stop, refusing to move forward or budge even an extra inch. Why had the truck stopped? What is the problem, Alicia? Why has the truck suddenly stopped? asked Mr. Landon. He was unclasping his safety belt, moving through the sea of sleeping bodies, towards the front of the minivan. He was the only man that could drink like a fish, and remained sober. Alicia's face grew crimson with embarrassment. She felt incredibly humiliated. I didn't realise I didn't have enough petrol in the tank, she whispered. The truth is, Alec, I'm awfully lost. I don't know where the hell I am. It's so dark out there. Everything looks exactly the same. I thought I was going to take a shortcut, but I've been driving around and around in circles. I don't know where the heck I am. "'Never you mind,' said Alec, detecting the rising level of anxiety in Alicia's voice, something he had never been privy to before, as the woman had nerves of steel, the hide of a rhino. "'This can easily happen. The back roads here can be very, very deceptive. I've got lost myself before in the past. Never you mind, Alicia. Everyone is far too plastered to know what's going on.' I'll get my wife to keep everyone calm if anyone should wake up. I tell you what, I'll try and find out where we are. I'll walk back to your house. I've got some petrol in the back of my truck. I'll go and get it for you and bring it here. But do you have a clue where we are? No, I don't, but I'll find out. I'm sure I will. It can't be that difficult. I notice you have a torch in the truck. I'll take that. I'm sure I'll find my way back to the house, so don't you worry your pretty face about anything, Alicia. Are you sure, Alec? That would be such an enormous help. You're such a star. Thank you so much. What's going on? came a drunken voice in the back. Why have we stopped? Has anyone got any more margaritas for me? Never you mind, said Felicia. We've just had a slight problem. Everything's going to be sorted out in a moment. The good news is that the people in the minivan appeared to be too inebriated to pay any attention to what was going on, which was a huge relief. Alec Landon's account. Apart from Alicia, it would seem I was the only one not completely bladdered in the minivan.
We had all gone too far at the bar, drinking way too much. Even my wife Ruth had not stopped giggling most of the way. It had been years since I'd seen her like this, all because of a 25% discount on the drinks which no one could resist. I'd never seen my wife ordering so many exotic cocktails before. She was just in her element. She ordered cold fashioned, which was whiskey with coffee liqueur. Then she ordered firecracker, which was bourbon with grapefruit juice, port, and raspberries. Then she ordered black eyed rye, which was a sagamore spirit rye with lime juice, ginger beer, blackberry syrup, and mint leaves. And then she ordered some pinhookers, which consisted of pinhook rye, iced tea, lemon syrup, lemon juice, and mint leaves. I'm not sure what the others in our group ordered, but let's just say we all went overboard. I was the one that stuck to my craft beers, but was fortunate to be able to handle my drink. Yet, even as I climbed out of the minivan with a torch in my hands, I did feel somewhat overwhelmed by the velvety black night, the tall silhouettes of the trees, the stretches of the long dirt road that lay ahead of me. Much like Alicia, despite the fact that I'd driven up and down these roads for over twenty years, I truly couldn't fathom where we actually were. Granted, I was a lot more sober than most, but I hadn't escaped some of the disadvantages of an alcoholic brain. I felt a little foggy and less stable on my feet, which didn't help me at all. I could not, for the life of me, comprehend why someone as clued up, shrewd, and savvy as Alicia could be so ignorant, naive, impetuous, and incautious as to risk taking a shortcut in her minivan down some of these rather dicey, dodgy lanes that can be very confusing, rather like a maze where you can get horribly lost. Everyone in these parts knows this to be a fact. They know it's unheedingly reckless, precipitous, extremely ill advised to be impulsive and to be daredevil like in taking shortcuts at night. But then again, the complacent smug Alicia had always placed herself above the Hoi Polloian society, seeing herself as an altogether different breed to the common man, rather like Amelia Eckhart, the first female to fly solo across the Atlantic. On many occasions, Alicia had drawn reference to the woman, describing herself in the same context as the esteemed pilot. I feel like we're both peas in a pod, she would exclaim. Indeed, if reincarnation is true, I would say without a shadow of a doubt that in my former life I was Amelia Eckerhart. The truth about this mini van trip is that what should have taken us a mere twenty minutes had taken a couple of hours. I made a note of where Alicia's mini van was parked. I continued to walk down the road heavily strewn with stones. And of course, the occasional pothole, which meant on a couple of occasions I tripped and nearly took a big tumble. There was a cool southerly breeze blowing through the tall vertical trees that pencilled up into the sky like formidable hostile giants. I say hostile as the ambience of this bodeful, inauspicious night felt distinctly unfriendly. I was surprised to realise how quiet it actually was. Now, let me assure you, when things are very still, The stillness has a distinct sound all of its own, a chilling sound that pierces through your very core like a sharp knife plundering through your chest. It's an uneasy feeling that niggles at you, whispering into your ears like a ghostly ethereal voice without audible distinguished words, but you can hear them as every cell of your body is alert, responsive to what you're perceiving in your environment. Without the normal chirping sounds of the crickets, Or the croaking of the frogs, I was very aware that something was very wrong. My father had always warned me as a young boy that when a place grows ominously quiet, there could potentially be a predator lurking around. It left me with chills meandering down my spine. I sensed that something was watching me, but then was it my imagination being just over creative? With just my tweed jacket on for protection, I could feel the icy wind biting me with freezing chills. That meant I stepped up my speed to keep as warm as I could. I certainly could not have navigated my way down this road without Alicia's torch, so I was ever grateful for small mercies, if there were any on this night. I glanced up at the velvety sky, marvelling at its inky blackness. The moon seemed almost veiled by a misty cloud cover, while the silvery stars, normally so bright and twinkling, looked dim, dull, and inconspicuous.
As I trudged down the road, surrounded on either side by hilly grassy embankments, fringed by tall Douglas fir trees, I could hear something was following me. I knew I wasn't mistaken. It sounded like bipedal footsteps, not what you would expect to hear from a mountain lion. But the heavy feet decimated, pulverising leaves and sticks beneath hardened soles. You could hear the twigs crunching, snapping and popping. Whatever it was plundered the ground with a thunderous footfall that gave me the distinct impression that my stalker had to be ponderous, very substantial in size. I glanced around nervously, my eyes drawn to the trees. I watched for any sign of movement, but I heard and saw nothing. I quickly increased my pace, finding a stick on the ground to use in self-defence. But as I moved, so did this thing that was clearly following me. It sounded as if the ground was groaning every time it picked up speed. When I slowed down, so did it. When I stopped, so did it. And when I increased my speed, so did it. Now I was really feeling frantic. I could feel my heckles rise. My heart was pounding violently in my chest. When I reached the end of the road, where there were two pronounced forks, I didn't know whether to turn left or right. I felt bewildered very confused. I actually said out loudly, damn, where the hell am I? Do I turn left? Do I turn right? What the heck do I do? I decided the left-hand turn looked more familiar. I was about to make the turn when I heard a strange roaring sound that was so discomposing it sent chills racing down my spine. What the hell was that? The daunting noise was more formidable and alarming than a lion's roar and I say that without a hint of exaggeration. That was when I saw it. It came thundering through the trees at one hell of a mighty speed. When you see something monstrously huge bounding towards you, your first reaction is, no, this can't be real. This is not happening. This must be the drink talking. Everything was so surreal to me that my fear was suspended, almost as if it had been held back for a while so that I could gain some sense of perspective over what was transpiring. I realised at once that this fragment of my imagination was not a spurious creature of fantasy fiction, but a real breathing creature. Then it hit me like a blinding revelation, almost as if you've walked into a dark room, fumbled around in the darkness, but when you reach for the light switch, you know what you're observing. The light reveals it clearly to you. So the thing you thought was a bookshelf, you realised was a bureau. The thing you thought was a couch, you realised was a futon. It was obvious to me that this extraordinary anomalous creature was a Bigfoot. This was hard for me to digest, assimilate or even swallow. Maybe the universe has a sense of humour. I felt as if the Bigfoot was laughing at my nonplussed expression. It was almost as if he sensed how stunned I was to see him. It was almost as if he was saying, don't look so bewildered, get over it, I'm as real as you are. The creature stood up on two legs like a human being, with exactly the same body structure and shape, with a few minor exceptions, the most poignant being the monstrous size of the creature, its muscular strength and tone. It was gargantuan, lofty, majestic, powerful, covered from head to toe with dark hair that appeared darker than the night as the contrast between the background and the Bigfoot was strikingly pronounced. This very masculine Bigfoot cowered in the light of my torch. He kept covering his eyes with his hands, but I guess I couldn't help just staring at the creature in total astonishment with a touch of wondrous awe thrown in for good measure. For a long time fear had not entered the equation for me, which I think was a jolly good thing, but when I saw the creature's eyes I knew at once that I had nothing to worry about. There are no words in the English language to describe the kindness and integrity of those eyes. I knew that I knew that he was friendly. I knew that I knew that he was trying to help me. I nodded at him and proceeded down the left path of the road. The creature shook his head at me, indicating for me to go to the right. But, I said to him, I need to get to Sunnydale Farmhouse. Using my stick, I drew my friend's farmhouse in the sand. The Bigfoot ran up to the drawing, which I lighted up with my torch. I drew Alicia's large, symmetrical farmhouse with the two imposing oak trees in the back. The Bigfoot nodded at me. He appeared excited, 
I realised he knew exactly what I was drawing. He nodded his head profusely, indicating for me to follow him. Once again, he was pointing to the right. He ran boldly ahead of me, swivelling his pyramid-shaped head around, rather like an owl's from time to time, to study me through his deep-set honey-coloured eyes that glittered with a red eye shine in certain lights, to check that I was indeed following him. He glided so smoothly and seamlessly across the ground, at a very fast speed, unhindered by the rocks and potholes in the road. He swung his overlong arms backwards and forwards in time with his five-foot strides. He moved as if he was floating like a sailboat, bobbing on the water. Unfortunately, I found myself breaking into a run, not to mention a hot sweat. Forget the cold. My heated body no longer felt the icy conditions. I couldn't believe it. There I was at Alicia's farm gate, with a loud, vibrant sign which read Sunnybrook Farm on the gatepost. I was thrilled. I nodded at the Bigfoot. He chatted away happily for a moment, pointing towards the farm. Then he turned around. I watched him gliding away, moving as gracefully as a cheetah and easily as fast. He turned around for a moment, glancing back at me one more time, nodding his head, and then he was gone. I managed to find my truck in the parking bay. I climbed in gratefully, started up the engine, and accelerated. Thanks to the Bigfoot's directions, I got a full sense of the geographic location at night, retracing my footsteps, making my way back to the minivan without much trouble at all. Alicia was thrilled to see me, marvelling at how quick I had been, while I secretly held on to the knowledge that without the Bigfoot, I would have most certainly ended up hopelessly lost. "'I'm so relieved you're back,' she whispered to me. "'Alec, I don't know how to thank you. Thank you so much. The people in the minivan are so wasted, they haven't got a clue what's going on. I'd be very grateful that when they're sober in the morning, if you would be so kind not to let any of them know about the hold-up, I have a reputation to keep up. I wouldn't dream of saying a word. I filled up Alicia's petrol tank for her. She was able to follow me back to the farmhouse. And then the drunk, grumbling people were offloaded, escorted to their various bedrooms. The following morning I woke up bright and early. The light was streaming through the windows, so I got up to pull the curtains to prevent my wife from waking up. It was a glorious day. I glanced out of the window to see the viridescent green fields surrounding Alicia's beguiling farmhouse, almost twinkling under the morning sun. I marvelled at how spectacular it all looked. I could see a couple of black Frisian horses grazing in the field, while the large silvery pond, surrounded by weeping willow trees, was covered with a sheen that reflected the trees. I could see a few deer gathering at the water's edge for a much-needed drink. When I went down the sweeping ornate staircase, I was struck by how quiet everything was this morning. When I entered the kitchen, Alicia was bustling around her range, busying herself frying bacon and eggs. Oh, Alec, she said, giving me a warm, effusive hug. You were my saving grace last night. Thank you, thank you so much for saving the day. It's only a pleasure, I said, knowing full well that the real person who should be receiving all the praise was an unlikely hairy man, but I was hardly going to breathe a word of my encounter with anyone, not even my own wife, I might add. Needless to say, the breakfast was served at half-past two in the afternoon. Everyone was sleeping off their hangovers and slept in very late. I'm glad to tell you that Bobby was reassuring Carter over bacon and eggs that his wife wasn't growing a beard, that she wasn't a bad cook, that he'd made up the story about the sausages in his jacket pocket that weren't as hard as bullets. While Carter was assuring Bobby that his wife wasn't a big fat cow after all, but most people listening to the two men trying to redeem themselves were not as easily fooled, for many a true thing is said in jest, especially under the influence of alcohol. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, what an incredible story. Until next time, goodbye and good night.